Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for the invitation. I love Second Baptist Church, have for a long, long time. And what an honor to be here tonight to uh, kind of bring a little bit of Israel to you guys. We're going to chase down the story of the woman at the well tonight. Everybody knows the story of the woman at the well. John chapter 4 is where we'll be headed. And I hope you're going to understand the story a little bit more by the time we get through. Uh, because I'm telling you, the land of the Bible has secrets to unfold for us. It's their backyard. It's not my backyard. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to take a trip. Now, this trip is a lot easier than the one we take, uh, well, the one I just took Wednesday night and the one I got to take next Sunday. I mean, that plane ride is horrible. So let's, let's ride Google Earth, shall we, as we go to Israel tonight. Now, look at all of the green in our country. That means we've got a lot of water. It's our, it's, besides our people, it's our greatest natural resource. Get to Israel, get to the Middle East, get to the northern part of Africa. It's obvious they do, they've got a water problem. I mean, water's a big deal in the Middle East. Water's a big deal in, in Israel. Now, we're going to go, again, we're going to John chapter 4, and the location of this story in John chapter 4 is in Samaria, in the heart of Samaria. And if you look at the mount today, you're going to get the unusual red line right in the middle of things, and that's going to be, um, that's going to be Samaria. It's going to be called the West Bank there today. And if you get inside the West Bank, you're going to see some signs that look like this. The sign will say, don't come in here if you're Jewish. This entrance is forbidden for Israeli citizens, and it's dangerous. And this passage, this is not our passage for tonight, but watch this. In Luke chapter 9, it says, Jesus sent his messengers ahead of him, and they went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was headed to Jerusalem. See, he's Jewish, and Samaritans don't like the people headed to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, those are two of the good ones. You know, this is, these are the winners here. They get to, they get, they see this and they say, Lord, would you like us to call down fire on them? I want to tell you something. If your plan A for dealing with people who don't look like you, act like you, vote like you is to just kill them, you got a problem. And these are disciples, good disciples, part of the, part of, part of the three, you know, Jesus rebuked them and they, they went into another village. But Jesus is going to take his disciples into the Samaria. The Bible simply says, as you, as you begin chapter, chapter 4 of John's gospel, he had to go through Samaria. Truth is, he didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, they almost never went through Samaria because of hard feelings like this. And that sign right there is, is over the same geographic community of what the Bible talks about in Samaria. And people, you know, people ask me when they find out I go to Israel and they see signs like this, they go, aren't you nervous to go to Israel? And I always give them the same answer. As soon as I get through Macon, Georgia, I start to relax. But I am pretty nervous going through Macon. You know, Israel is a very safe country. I think you'd like it if you've not been there. How many of you have been to Israel? I know some of you have gone, look at all the hands tonight. Oh, my goodness. That's like the highest percentage ever. Did you know on average only 1% of the people who, are, who go to church have, are ever going to get to Israel, only 1%. And so my ministry is about bringing the message from the land of the Bible to audiences everywhere, and so that's what we're doing tonight. So let's, uh, let's zoom down to where this story took place because we're going to be in the heart of Samaria. To, if, you, if you're into modern-day politics, this is the West Bank. It's, it's carved out of Israel. Israel's very very small country. That's one reason you can see it in such a short period of time. You can put five Israels side by side in the state of Georgia. And so we're going now into modern day Nablus. This is also Shechem from the days of uh, Abraham and Jacob. Jacob's well is here. Uh, Joshua brought his people back. And on one side, on, on Mount Gerizim, he would put the peop half the people and they repeated the blessings of following God's law. On the other half, Mount Ebal the, the curses of not following God's law. So this is a very famous community already in the Bible. And when Jesus gets here during New Testament times, it's called Sychar. And as you know, he met a woman at the well here. So let's read the story while, while in the village of, um, of ancient Sychar. The Bible says, chapter 4, verse 4 of John's gospel, now he had to go through Samaria and he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. There's the reference to Jacob's well. It's probably the well Jesus stopped at. He's thirsty. It's hot. It's in the heartland of Israel. I promise you it's hot. 
It's, uh, it's, it's just it's closer to the equator. It's very, very hot. As tired as he was, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. And a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asked her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples, all 12 of them, had gone into the village to buy some food. That's another sign that they were nervous about being here. And, you know, because they're, they're like, how many does it really take to go get food for 13 people? It doesn't take 12 to go get food for 13. But 12 feels better going into the wrong side of town to the wrong grocery store to buy, you know, food that you hope won't kill you when you get back and have the picnic. But they all go in, and that leaves Jesus alone with the woman who's come out to the well. Would, would you give me a drink, he asked her. And, and John even adds, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water. Now, I just want to stop there. I think you know the rest of the story. Probably do. But if you don't, you can read on, or I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, they, they have this back and forth conversation that's really, it sounds kind of rude. As a matter of fact, the woman, in the, at least in the scripture, never gives Jesus the drink of water he asked for. She's just all about, we're different. You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. Are you really going to drink out of my Samaritan label, ladle? And, you know, and, and, and then the disciples come back, and about that time, Jesus has confronted her. And we're going to pick that story up in just a minute. But here's my main point. Jesus said to her, if you had asked, if you had known the gift of God and who it is who asked you for water, you could have asked, and he would have given you living water. And she seemed to know what he was talking about. But you know, it's not my backyard. And to me, growing up in church like I did, maybe you're like me, I, I grew up with the King James Bible. I grew up, you know, hearing the King James Bible. And after a while, it, it's like Jesus just talks, Jesus just says stuff like this. Instead of saying, I've, I've got the peace that you want, I've got what you want, he, he would say something. It's poetic, you know, I, I'll offer you living water. But she seemed to know something that I don't know. And now that I've been to the land, I know exactly what she was thinking that Jesus was saying. And I know what Jesus was trying to illustrate for her. And we're going to go chase it down. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, you've got to know that water, again, is critically important. And people had to store water all year long to drink it. You know, if they were going to have water, in, say, in September or October, it only rains in the winter. So the rains will start coming down and... November, latter half of November, they, and, and then December's pretty rainy, and January's pretty rainy, and then February it starts to taper off, and after that you get a few showers in, in March, and then it doesn't rain. I mean, it does not rain. It'd be easy to be a weatherman in, in Israel, because once you get to, to April, you're just saying, well, it's going to be sunny today, and, and it's going to be sunny for the next 200 days. And it's just not going to rain again until November. That's pretty easy weather forecast. Now, here's a water cistern in Jerusalem. Would you really want to, to drink in that water cistern? You know, what if you're hot? Could you go swimming there? If you go swimming in the community's water supply, you may never be able to walk again after your parents get through with you. Now, here is some water in what's called a mikvah, but I couldn't resist putting this picture in. This is in Magdala, where Mary's from, Mary Magdalene. Um, and, and it had rained the day before, and so this water was very clear, and I kind of like that. It's certainly much better than that water, don't you think? Now, that, that's, that's going to be some cistern water. And you think when she comes out to the well, she's, yeah, it may be a well like you're used to in South Georgia or where maybe you even have a well today that you, I'm, my grandparents had a bucket that actually went down in a well, and we could get it there, you know. I mean, that was, that was a long time ago, uh, but check that out. What if you had to drink out of water like this? You see, by August, that may be what it looks like. And if you've ever wondered why there's so much wine in the Bible, this is why. You see, the wine, it's not about getting drunk. It's about putting something on the table that won't make your family sick. You've got to do something to boil the water, to make the water where you can store it, where it's in a safe form. But I promise you, this kind of water right here, I've seen people actually get in that water, wash their clothes in that water, and, and even pull some out. I pray they're not drinking it. And what if you had to, to get your water from a water shaft like this? This is down in Beersheba. 
Beersheba's uh, Abraham lived there during part of his days. And you go to this water shaft, and it's amazing. And this is not the only one. This is actually pretty typical. Look at the steps going down here. Now watch this drone video. We're just going to keep going down in the steps and down in the steps. And what if you had a heavy water jug like this one? And this one does date back to the time of the New Testament. So if you want to come out and check it out, you know, it's uh, the guy who sold it to me tried to tell me it could have been the one. You know, the woman left it at the well. told him I couldn't afford that one, but I'd, I'd buy this one. And then we just kind of worked out a price for it. But no, seriously, there's a lot of artifacts. Um, that's one of the things that surprises people is that you, you can, they're, they're finding so much stuff in Israel. And most of, the, most of what's been discovered in Israel has been discovered since 1990. 1990. And, and the land is just, it's just, it's coming right out of the dirt. Archaeologists are doing us a favor. Now, let me, let me just, just stop and do a little sermon within the sermon. A hundred years ago, there were scholars, sometimes even in seminaries, it was cutting-edge education to say, when we find out all the evidence, when archaeology does its work, when science finally gets to the Bible, we're going to find out that the Bible's not true, that the Bible's not literally true, but that just the opposite has happened. As archaeologists keep digging things up, now, now, literally, millions of things have been found. Entire cities have been found. That, that Magdala I was telling you about, Mary Magdala, uh, from there, first time I went there was 2015. For years, we rode by this piece of dirt, and they started building a hotel there. They went 18 inches down and found a synagogue. I have not read about, seen, heard about a single archaeological find that has, that has somehow proved the Bible wrong in any shape or fashion. It's amazing what's happening in our generation in Israel. But what if you had to go down there and get the water and bring it all the way back up in a jug like that? I, I've never put water in it. I don't know what would happen if we put water in it after all these years. But I suspect at least a gallon will go in there, maybe a gallon and a half. Do you know the average Americans uses about 150 to 180 gallons of water a day? That's saying something when the average man in America only uses 75 gallons a day, by the way. I just made that number up. But I did have three daughters, and they used a lot of water. Um, so I'm just saying, what if you had to depend on those water supplies and that jug? That's what that woman at the well is dealing with. That's her life. That's, that's why she's out there, and, and that's just standard fare. And she's in a very hot, baked environment. We know nothing about drought in this country. We had a drought for many years in the southeastern United States. We never stopped going swimming. We barely stopped watering our lawns if, if, if we even did. And yet they kept telling us we were in a drought. You get a drought in this land, it's life-threatening. And they didn't have much water, and they didn't use much water. They didn't, therefore, think about it. They didn't take a lot of baths. They, they didn't, they weren't, able to refresh themselves. They, didn't, they probably didn't have enough water even to, to fully satisfy what the body needs. And she's out there at the well in the middle of the day, and this is her life. And Jesus said, you could have had living water. And she rightly says, where are you going to get this living water? I think she kind of snapped it at him. Where are you going to get that living water around here? I mean, they don't like each other. I mean, Jesus likes her. She doesn't know he likes her, but she doesn't like him. I want to show you the land. The Benjamin Desert is between Jericho and Jerusalem. And the Benjamin Desert looks nice and soft. It's not really soft, but there's not a tree on the road that leads from Jericho to Jerusalem. All of these little green bushes are there. Now, we took this, uh, this video in the spring. We, we almost always go in March to do our video shoots. And so we're right there at the greenest time of the year. If you were to go back today, uh, anything that looks remotely green right now is gone. It's, it's just all brown. Even you know, the bushes, they, I don't, they're some hardy, hardy bushes with incredible roots. There is a little bit of water on the road that leads from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's the ancient biblical road. It's the Good Samaritan Road. It's the road Mary and Joseph took to Christmas. It's a very famous road. It's an incredible road. And there's a little bit of water there, which is the confirmation we needed that indeed it is the road. But that's the Benjamin Desert. If you go south of the Benjamin Desert alongside the Dead Sea, it's about a 56-mile stretch. You're going to get the Judean wilderness. This is where John the baptizer came from. This is where Jesus went into the Judean wilderness 
as he prepared for his ministry and would spend the time there, it's not soft at all. It's rocky. It's hard. We're going to come back to that in a minute. I want you to also see that there's also the Negev Desert. So if you go further south, you've, you've got the Negev Desert. And I mean, this is unbelievably difficult. This is the land where Moses and the children of Israel are wandering around. This, this, is, this will put a new understanding on that whole wilderness wandering thing. They weren't whining like a bunch of spoiled children when they ran out of water real quick in this journey. They were on a desperate search for fresh, fresh water. Water is life. And that's the Negev Desert. But if you go from the bottom of the Red Sea right here, the, the north end of the Red Sea, and just work your way up about 100 miles, you'll get back into the Judean wilderness. And that's really the hard desert land that most of the people knew. Not that not many of them would spend time there. But you get up there in the Judean wilderness, and you're going to get, get this, this row of canyons, deep ravines. They call them wadis in Israel. And, and, and you see the wadis there, and it's just, it's just almost unbelievable how harsh they are. The flash floods, the, the, it rains in Jerusalem, it rains in Bethlehem, it rains along that Judean ridge. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. It's only 15 miles away. And so the flash floods carve out these great canyons. And uh, it was, it, on this particular day we shot that video, it, we had a hailstorm, and then we had a flash flood. It was really cloudy. So we'll go up a little, little more north to make sure you get the full impact of the visual method of these, these great canyons. Because these canyons go along the Judean wilderness, go along the Dead Sea shoreline about every mile, every two miles, uh, you know, you get another canyon. And the only time these canyons ever have water in them is when it rains, and so that'll be in the winter, and then it's going to be a flash flood. It's really too much water. Sometimes in those narrow passageways, it might be, the water might be 30 feet high, running 70 miles an hour. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a question of whether or not people will die every year in the flash floods. It's a question of how many people will die. They get caught in the canyons, they're hiking in the canyons, or, or they're trying to cross a road that doesn't look like it's got that much water on it. But the flash flood comes, and, and, and it's just a disaster. Last year we were there, um, we, we saw 10 high school graduates wiped out in one flash flood. And four more before the day was over. It, it was just one of the worst days in, in modern, modern history. The whole country, we felt like our hearts were broken. But that's the flash floods. Now, there is one place and only one of these canyons where you can find something different. It's like water world. It's like a water park in there. And you get in this particular canyon, and what we're doing, and we're going to En Gedi. You may know, if you're a good Bible reader, you know that David hid from Saul in En Gedi. Well, it's pretty obvious why he hid there. Now, if you were willing to go on this hike, this, there, there's actually the canyon kind of splits. And so on the left side, you have to really hike back in there. And that's about a two-mile walk. And you get back in there, and amazingly, as you, as you see this canyon, it looks like all the other canyons until you start seeing a little bit of water in the bottom and a few more trees. Something's different. We've got a little water here. You get all the way back, you'll find what they call the hidden waterfall. And I'm telling you, it's like, it's like that miracle that Moses needed. Water just comes out of the rock. It, it, there, there apparently is a huge aquifer in the Judean wilderness where the little bit of water that does sink into the ground works its way down to that Dead Sea level, and it's stored up in that aquifer, and it didn't get it, it just burst forth. Now, this is the cleanest water, the purest water. It's also refreshing. Picture this being a 115-degree day, which I've been there. And you, and you get to go swimming. You can, you can sit under these waterfalls and let it just massage your shoulders. I mean, that feels so... I, I try to do that every time I go. Now, on the other side of this, this same oasis is a more famous David's waterfall. And, and you, get, you get the image here, and here's the deal. In Hebrew, water is mayim. Why don't we, do, why don't we learn some Hebrew tonight? Mayim. Say mayim. Mayim is water. And chaim, you kind of have to clear your throat with that. So chaim, say that, means life. Mayim chaim is living water. That's a phrase that they use. It's water that has life in it. It's different from cistern water. It's different from well water. Water like this, you can 
well, I, hey, you can play in it. You can bathe in it. You, you can be refreshed by it. It's clean. It's pure. It's so pure they bottle this stuff, and they sell it as En Gedi water all over Israel. It's bottled water. It's cleanest water in Israel. It's purest water in Israel. And you know what? You can go to bed tonight if you're camping out in En Gedi, even in a drought, and when you wake up in the morning, it'll still be there. Jesus asked this woman for some water, and she snaps back at him, and they go back and forth and said, you know, if you knew who, who it was that was asking you and what God's trying to offer you, to, I, I, you could have had some living water. And she says, where are you going to get it? They're probably 70 miles from En Gedi. There are other waterfalls in Israel, but she was nowhere near one, not in the heart of Samaria. You know, Jesus wasn't really offering her something that her body needed. I mean, we all have to have the water. You know what he was offering her. He was offering her a solution for her life, her brokenness. She was at the well in the middle of the day at noon, and there was nobody else there because all the other women came in the morning or maybe in the evening. That's when the crowd would gather around the well, and she's intentionally come out in the middle of the day because she has so many broken relationships in her life. And we know this because Jesus asked her, I mean, she just continued to be rude to him, and so finally he says, why don't you go get your husband and call him, bring him back, and we'll, we'll talk about it. And she says, well, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. And he says, very truly I say unto you, which means finally you've said something right. You don't have, any, you don't have a husband because you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. She immediately understands that he's a religious man, a holy man, a prophet. She, he knows something about her that supernaturally had to be delivered to him. And so she shifts the conversation very quickly to religion. Every pastor in this town, including yours, has had that experience where you're in a hardware store and you, you're, you're talking to somebody about nuts and bolts or lumber or something that's not to do with church and you didn't wear your pastor shirt. And, and in the conversation that ensues, they find out you're a pastor and all of a sudden the conversation turns to religion. It happens a lot. You know, they, it's like, oh, you're a pastor. You're a pastor in this church, oh, that second Baptist church. Yeah, I, I go by that church a lot. My aunt goes to church every Sunday. My uncle was a preacher, good one too, you know. And what he's trying to say is, I don't go to church, but I know people who do, but I'd like to talk to you about religion. That's all she was doing with Jesus. And she talks about our ancestors worship on this mountain. You Jews say you ought to worship in Jerusalem. Those two mountains I showed you at the very beginning, Gerizim and Ebal, well, they had a worship place up there on top of Gerizim. The, the ruins of the worship center, or I, I visited them not long ago, a couple of months ago. It's, it's all right where it should be, which is part of the apologetics of understanding that the Bible's telling us the truth. But here's the thing about this woman. You know, Jesus is saying, I've got something you'd like to, that, that I can offer you. It's going to be like, like living water. Wouldn't you like a peace that passes all understanding? Wouldn't you like a life that's so full you have to call it an abundant life? She gets so excited, she leaves a water jug at the well, runs into town, tell some people in her village what's going on, and, and they come out and invite Jesus to stay. About the same time, the disciples come back with the food. Pretty much, I can see the disciples. They've done this in some other situations where they're saying, come on, Jesus, here's the food. Let's get out of here. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he's like, got to change in plans. Let's stay here tonight. In fact, let's stay a couple of nights. And I imagine he put them all in a different home, you know, you know, so they could get to know the kids, play a little soccer with the kids, and, and eat around the table. Discover that these people that you were so afraid of and you got so much prejudice against, turns out they're just people. And it's, and it's such an amazing transition that takes, uh, uh, transformation that takes place in that community because the woman discovers what she needed in fact, she starts making those good relationships happen again in the community, and the community gets changed, all because Jesus walked into their lives, and even the disciples are transformed. They have a story they'll never forget to tell. Now, let me, let me shift gears. Look, look at this canyon. Now, I'm telling you, I, I'm not, I've been to Israel 20 times now, and I could not just eyeball that canyon and tell you which wadi it is. There's no way. 
You, you, you head down, you know, 56 miles along the Dead Sea. You know, let's pull out of this one for a minute. It's 56 miles north to south on the Dead Sea. It's a little smaller than it used to be. It was an ecological emergency, actually. But there's canyons, seriously, one mile every two miles, lots and lots of canyons. And if you go that next 100 miles down to the top of the Red Sea, there, there, there's even more. Canyon after canyon after canyon. And if you get lost, you're hiking out there. Imagine you, you're, you're walking, you didn't have enough supplies, you ran out of water, and you come across the Dead Sea. Now, you see it from a distance, you're a stranger to the land, and you didn't know that it's one-third salt, at least in the bottom. It's eight times saltier than the, than the ocean. So not only can you not drink this water, if you drink it, you'll actually be more thirsty than you were, and your body is going to crave it, and actually, you'll shut your body down. You drink the Dead Sea water, you, you'll die. You get it in your eye, you go into the emergency room. I like to think of the Dead Sea as a living illustration of our culture, what it has to offer us. There's so many people, so many things, so many addictions out there that say, drink of this and you'll finally be happy. And it just doesn't work. But one of these canyons has living water in it, only one. And it's got so much living water in it, you can play in the water. There's plenty of plant life, animal life. It's no wonder David hid from Saul at En Gedi. He had food to eat. He had water to drink. He had caves to hide in. And it, it was a great place to hide. And, and you'll find En Gedi and some other Bible references. It makes sense that people, that armies would camp out there. But which one of these canyons will take you to life when there's a hundred of them. You know, Jesus said, I am the way. And that word for way in the Greek is also path. You, there's, there's a path that leads through this one that will, will take you to the water. But you've got to invest two miles in it. And if you're already dying of thirst, you better choose the right one. And we, we, live in a, we live in a time when people or getting the message across loud and clear that they believe all religions are, same, are the same, that religion's really not even important. But to tell you the truth, it is important. I mean, that woman at the well who was so broken with so many broken relationships, so unhappy, so empty, so dry, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, maybe even physically, she needed something. She wasn't just on a, a search for, for water at at her well. She was actually on a desperate search for living water that would give her hope. Jesus has that hope. I mean, that's the message of this church. That's a, the message that's changed our lives. I hope your life has been changed by Jesus, the living water. And I really don't think it's a big surprise that when Jesus asked his followers to, be, to, to take part in a sign that would say, I've decided to follow Jesus, I don't really think I'm, I'm surprised that that it, he would say, I want you to be lowered down into living water because any fresh water like the Jordan River is called living water, Mayim Chaim. And it is such an incredible symbolic act. So I'm here tonight to talk in part to anybody who wants to go to Israel. We'd love to talk to you, but the much more important message is do you know this Jesus who offers water that gives us life? Do, do you know that of all the different choices you could make in life, like canyons lined up alongside the Dead Sea, that only one of them actually leads to a life-changing experience that will give you everything you've always wanted? The peace that passes all understanding? The joy of an abundant life? The, the joy of knowing that no matter what my circumstances are, I can still have hope for tomorrow. And I can go to bed tonight knowing that if for whatever, maybe my time comes before the morning is up, you know what? I'll have more living water than ever when I wake up on the other side. Do you know that, Jesus? And if you do, have you known the joy of believer's baptism? It's, it's, it's fun baptizing people in the Jordan River. Um, it's, it's literally a refreshing moment because the, wa the water seems to always be extremely cold. 
And people are almost gasping for air as they come up, but they're so excited. You don't have to go to Israel to be baptized in the Jordan River to know that same excitement. You, you can find it here at this church. You can find it in the church you attend on a regular basis. You can find it in God's Word every single day. I, I'm just telling you, I hope you found the living water. It's changed my life, and it's still changing lives today. Let's pray.